with respect to white flint, which is another issue that all of us will be grappling with, one of the pieces of conversation that has many people in the community nervous relates to the schools. Right, mm -hmm. and justifiably so. Okay, mm -hmm. so my question to you is, what is it that you can tell the community that is concerned? One, there are a lot of people that are hoping that Rocking Horse would be reopened. There are other people that are concerned about the impact on Walter Johnson and the potential for redistricting. What is, and these aren't issues that, unless I'm mistaken, we're going to be able to address definitively when we take up white flint because these are issues that will play out over many years over time. The people are nervous about them at a time when we are making decisions about white flint. <coughs> well, can you tell people? Yeah, rocking that? Horse is not, um, I mean, I have it under consideration. But it certainly uh, doesn't have uh, the particulars that I would want because it's outside of and would cause a tremendous realignment and it is highly utilized right now as our center. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes under what conditions in the current uh, situation can we have adequate facility land, if you will, or uh, <coughs> work with uh, other agencies together to place a building in a proper location that would fit within that uh, current uh, attendance area and would serve the needs of the kids. And that is uh, what we will work closely with your staff and we'll work closely with the whole master plan thing to try to figure out. Uh, but I don't, I haven't come to any conclusion that Rocking Horse would be a viable alternative, okay? So that's, you know, in my recommendation. I've looked at it, looked at it, looked at it, and it's just really hard to make it a viable alternative. I think the best thing for that whole area is to try to find some location within that area that would service uh, as a place to build a facility. And that's what we're taking a look at. And so far, we've not had anybody uh, provide us with uh, a good alternative on that. My understanding is the planning board yeah. looked at several options yeah. and concluded that they weren't good alternatives. Yeah, right. <laughs> so in the absence of you coming up with something that they weren't able to bring about, it well, does seem look harder. Because I, I, you know, I'm sorry, we're, we're just not going to, you know, we, we would be solving one problem and creating two more, I'm afraid. And I think for the long-term good of the county, we have to think holistically about how we make that work. And that's, you know, that's, that's a problem. Because the rocking horse is in an area that is also growing. And maybe nudged out in that race. <laughs> Before I give up my time, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate you also on the opening of Bell's Mill. Yeah, wasn't uh, that great? Oh my goodness, the, yeah. the community there is so pleased with it. It also had a lot of green in it as well, and the community is very happy. So congratulations to you. I was so proud of the board and, and the council for naming the school uh, with the Shriver last night, the icon of the uh, community, Sarge and Mrs. Shriver. And uh, she was there for that dedication, and the whole family was there for that dedication. I'm just really pleased that Gibbs has got a name on it, Roscoe Nix has got a name on it, Sergeant Shriver's got a name on it. That took a great deal of courage for your board because there's lots of uh, people that would like to name people, uh, name things after rivers and lakes and boundaries and stuff like that. They're, they're really going after it. They started with Marsh, uh, Matsunaga. I think that says a lot about the community. Valerie, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on something that Pat O'Neill said earlier about um, what's happening in the county in that we're seeing this growth in the student population, but not necessarily from from new development. And we've been seeing this trend happening for a while, and now it's in Bethesda and Chevy Chase and other areas of the county outside of uh, City Spring. <coughs> In the down county, and I, I think there's an opportunity coming up in the 2010 census to work very closely with the school system, I believe, because I just I just saw a map yesterday of areas of the county where 
uh, there is anticipated to be uh, undercounting. A lot of it is in these very areas where what you have now is multi-generational families living in a house. They weren't there before, those children weren't there before. So I think we have a really great opportunity to count because we benefit and those families benefit if we count it right. So I was wondering what you're doing uh, in We're conjunction. working very closely. I was with the census people yesterday. Uh, they claim the number is about $14,000 for every person you find. Mm -hmm. I like that. That sounds good. <laughs> because that is uh, something that you get aid for, the counties, everything is figured that way. And historically, we have been um, underground compared to the state. And I think uh, we're going to try to work with the Census Bureau, uh, try to work with the takers, uh, try to do everything we can to share any information that we possibly can uh, the, with that government agency that is uh, go-between to see if we can find every child and adult and get them counted because that will benefit everybody in this county for a decade. That's what I didn't realize. I mean, they do these annual updates, but they never change the way they distribute the money. So you got like one shot and I'm glad you brought it up because it's very important, very important. George? Well, just to put it on the table, because I we, we were meeting, we're likely to reappoint a couple of Housing Opportunities Commissioners and in the course of that conversation, um, with respect to the Walter Johnson cluster, the HOC headquarters, some years ago, HOC really wanted to vacate its headquarters and was looking for um, alternative sites and actually had an option on a building in Wheaton that ultimately fell through, but as we're looking at Wheaton revitalization, as we're looking at what's going to go at the Glenmont Metro Station, what's going to go at Shady Grove Metro Station, what's going to go at White Flint Metro Station, you know, HOC ought to be at a metro station. It's a, um, you know, it's, it's a good, particularly in this economy, it's a pretty attractive, long-term, stable, uh, either tenant or purchaser, and then that would free up the school and exactly. down some clusters. So yeah. just, you know, put that on the table at the planning board, didn't recommend it, and I guess HOC you know, Norm Dreyfus said, well, of course, somebody's got to pay for it, but they're paying very little now for the use of the school, but it's not, it's a suboptimal location for HOC. On the questions that Mike Knapp was asking, I'm going to be the skunk at the dinner party and be a little more explicit about it. If the school system believes that the smart growth relocation plan is a threat to our ability to get into the buildings we need and reduce the number of portables that we want to reduce, either on the record or off the record or, you know, in our offices <coughs> privately or something, we really need to understand that because um, as you know, the executive branch, Department of Finance is reassuring us everything's going to be fine, we can make everything fit, we can pay for all of it, it's going to be terrific. And if the school system has, has run the numbers and has numbers that tell us a story that we need to know, we really need to know it, maybe not here at this lunch table, but before we vote for that, because we're going to vote for that in advance of approving the CIP in the spring. And that's a big decision coming up. And the big question that a lot of it has is, what does it mean for high school modernizations that we've already delayed, that we promised communities that they're waiting for? What does it mean for meeting the bulge in elementary school enrollment? What does it mean for reducing portals? All the things you're talking about, which absolutely, I mean, you made a great, you started out with a great presentation, Jerry. And, you know, yeah, let's build some schools. Let's put some people to work. Let's stimulate the economy. Let's, you know, get rid of portables. Absolutely, I'm, I'm all for that. But if this smart growth revitalization plan puts any of that very attractive picture at risk, you know, don't just don't don't just be um, uh, don't just allude to it. I mean, we, we really need to know the answer to that before we raise our hands and vote. Okay. Nancy. Uh, yes, I I I think that is a, a fair point. Uh, though I I don't see that personally as an issue. But if you have a concern, we <coughs> we I guess we request that you let us know. Uh, likewise, on the, uh, I'd like to piggyback on uh, uh, Roger's questions, and to a certain degree, uh, George's as well. I'm, spend, I'm spending a lot of time sending people to groups. Uh, I hope they're going to groups. Uh, to, to validate what I'm telling communities, which is that my pay grade is not up to being, on the, being a member of the Board of Education. Uh, and we defer entirely to the board, as far as I'm concerned, on issues of school locations, boundary changes, and the like. And there's a certain amount of confusion right now uh, because of what the planning board is saying 